and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Tim Miller, in for Charles J. Sykes. We've got a big Friday weekend edition for you. Uh, our guest today is the best friend that I made after the age of 30, which is a significant title, Peter Hamby uh, of Puck.News and Snapchat and a bunch of other stuff. And before we get to Peter, though, I just want to plug for anyone that is not a Bulwark Plus subscriber, last night we taped our yearly Festivus episode where we talked about the person, that uh, the bad person that got what they deserved this year. We have our airing of a grievances. There may be a feats of strength. Uh, I think it's something that you all would enjoy. Uh, you can get your favorite squishy centrist rhino, a Bulwark Plus subscription for Christmas this year. They can go back and watch last night's live stream up on Bullock Plus right now for members only. Also, as always, for all the tweens in your life and teens and, you know, maybe even 20-somethings you see over Christmas, please plug Not My Party, uh, which is doing well on Snapchat, not nearly as well as our guest show is doing on Snapchat, but it does pretty good. And uh, this week, I, I do a very deep dive on the Magaverse and all of the weird and kind of gross and ugly characters like chinless Jason Miller, who hasn't paid his child support, and uh, the son of Herschel Walker, who is a gay, conservative, Starbucks slurping insurrectionist. Very interesting characters. You'll enjoy it. Watch out this week's Not My Party. Uh, but next, we'll get to the episode uh, with Peter Hamby. But before we do that, our friends at Wet Leg. My mother's worried. Peter, thank you so much for coming. I needed to start us off with a little chaise long because last night I, I attended uh, the Wet Leg concert here at the Rickshaw Stop in uh, San Francisco. So I'm a little bit hungover. I'm not batting 100% on today's podcast, so you're going to have to carry me. And I just wanted to let you know, it was like 07 you know, and when Arctic Monkeys came over before they had a full album out, you know, there was just this little buzzy band that had two songs that everybody was into. And I was very excited for that. The only problem last night with a wonderful show by Wet Leg is that all of the people that were at that Arctic Monkey show in 2007 were also at the Wet Leg show. There were no new people. So if you were no. 25 in 2007, you were 40 at the Wet Leg concert last night. So Tyler said that there was a 98% record-playing ownership at the Wet Leg show last night at the Rickshaw stop. So I don't know how that makes you feel, but that that is what's coming down the pike for you. So I, yeah, I can pressure test that observation I'm going to see churches here in Los Angeles Friday night and wet leg is opening. I just really would have thought a church is definitely has the like mid to older millennial appeal. So I'm expecting mm. that, that demo there, but I thought there'd be more kind of like sad girl bedroom pop <laughs> types, like at that show at the wet leg show, like TikTokers and you know, there were um, no TikTokers. There was not a wow. single person TikToking in the audience. And she even has, they even have like one of the songs they played that has like an Olivia Rodrigo vibe, a little bit of a good for you vibe. So no TikTokers. Hopefully that is different in Los Angeles. That might be a, uh, a function of the fact that San Francisco, you know, you can't afford to live in San Francisco if you're 22 years old anymore. So uh, that might have been the problem. I'll, I'll look forward to your report. But Rather than doing a deep dive on pitchfork buzz bands, which I would really like to do, but I don't know that that's what the audience is here for. Um, I want to talk to you about, you know, a little politics. Um, you are writing now for Puck, which I would describe as this might this might hurt your feelings a little bit. So don't don't let it hurt your feelings. Just let me get it all, all out. Reported gossip. So it's not like gossip like, oh, I saw Don Lamont shirtless in a Provincetown bar kind of gossip. It's like, <laughs> this is what is being whispered about at the top levels of media and politics and tech. And and we're here to report for you what people are whispering about. And it's it's there's been some pretty good whispers. Is that, yeah, is that you know, a fair I, description of Puck? Yeah, and thank you for acknowledging that I, I frequently have feelings and you frequently hurt them, um, <laughs> but you also make me feel good. But yeah, no, I think that's a, a roundabout way of saying that we try to report on what's really going on in those worlds, you know? So we, this is sort of an informal point of view, but not afraid to pull punches. 
we say the quiet thing out loud. But, I, you know, we also do reporting. Like I'm writing something right now about Biden's actually kind of atrocious poll numbers among young people and spending a lot of time talking to experts in in that space, uh, you know, people who understand the 18 to 29 year old voter and why they don't like Joe Biden, Gen- why why Zoomers are turning on Biden. And that's that's reporting that hopefully you're not getting anywhere else. Okay, well, can you give us a little tease about that? Uh, this was not I did not want to start the show with sad news about Joe Biden's status with Zoomers, but you've t- you've int- you've intrigued me. What is yeah, what, so what, what are you learning? He almost all of Biden's negative movement uh, when you look at age groups, is actually coming from young people. Older voters like Gen Xers and Boomers are pretty stable in their general sort of dislike, upside down approval ratings for Biden. Um, Biden's support, he was he was basically like 23 points above board early in the presidency with voters under 30. Now, only about 29% of 18 to 29 year olds approve Joe Biden's job. 50% of young people disapprove. What do and these spoiled brats want? What's their problem? What, I what, think is, what is their issue? Without repeating the phrase you just mentioned, I think, one, there's a kind of impatience uh, at, in that generation. And that's that's born out of a lot of experiences that you and I, older millennials, didn't have. And, and some of this is just talked about all the time, that Zoomers and younger millennials were born. They don't remember a time before 9-11. They were born into economic a time of economic distress. The democracy is falling apart, climate change. And, you know, the Joe Manchin and Build Back Better and all this slow moving long tail legislation in Washington isn't really the kind of stuff that's firing them up. That's part of it. Um, actually, I think I found a phrase today that you will appreciate, Tim. I was reading a McKinsey study about Gen Z, which is very neo-lib of me, um, okay. but uh, they were describing Gen Z as, quote, identity nomads. And and that means that, you know, first of all, Gen Z doesn't identify with groups and parties and institutions very much. That's talked about a lot. They're skeptical of those things. Trust is a hard thing to come by. But two, like, they like trying on different hats, you know? I want to dabble over here a little bit, and that could apply to gender and sexuality, and it could apply to music, it could apply to politics. And it's just like a hard to reach demographic in the Obama years. Like if you came of age politically in the Obama years, you were sort of dialed in with the Democratic Party because Democrats back then were cool. Um, And millennials feel a little more attachment to groups than Gen Z does. Gen Z didn't come up with any attachment to a specific politician other than maybe Bernie Sanders. And he's not of the Democratic Party, and he preaches a different kind of politics than Joe Biden, who is, you know, they got their Bernie oh, era, oh. they got their flop era, their tanky era, you know, <laughs> like they're just kind of going around. I, is this a problem, though? I guess it's a midterm concern because there's a turnout concern, right? I mean, it's not as if like Donald Trump's numbers and, you know, it's not like there's this great Ron DeSantis dandum that you're uncovering in the the 29 year olds. Exactly. This is something I tried to sort out because I think both of us in part by having shows on Snapchat encounter in our real lives, young people, some of them are kind of MAGA Republicans who are the turning point, Charlie Kirk, Candace Owens types. And I'm like, are these, are these making up more of Gen Z than we think? And it really turns out if you look at the data and talk to experts on this stuff at various centers that study youth <laughs> stuff, th- it is really like a, a noisy minority. They're not – young people aren't flipping to Republicans. Gen Z, they care deeply about inclusion and diversity. Um, that's a huge thing. And so they're not in jeopardy of really being peeled off by MAGA Republicans or like, you know – Matt Gates, in other words, like thinks he's cool because he goes to turning point conferences and gets lavished and praised by those folks. But like that, he's not cool in that world. Um, the issue is what you said. It's a midterm turnout motivation thing. And it, it just Biden is old. That's part of it, too. Um, but it just doesn't feel like he is addressing their priorities. Student loan relief was paused. And then like. COVID too sucks for that generation. You know, they're it's really sort of sucks. a gig economy. They, there are plenty of millennials who haven't figured out like how to have a successful career and, and bank account yet. But, you know, it's way worse for Gen Z, like coming into this world, maybe they're still in college, maybe they're out of college. And it's just like, this shit sucks. And, and for them, 
it, it, like, why would they be fired up for Joe Biden? That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, so it's on Democrats in the Senate, House, Gov, down ballot races next year to figure out ways to appeal to that demographic and get them fired up. Because this is also interesting, like in the heady progressive resistance days of 2018, youth turnout as a share of the whole electorate was even higher than it was in Obama's two elections. And really? Yeah, and that, negative that, partisanship. It was like negative Trump partisanship. Yeah, it was a freak. reaction to yeah. Trump. Yeah. This is another reason there's not a lot of affinity to, to Biden is a lot of the organizing in 2018 among young people was there was the March for Our Lives stuff. It was sort of like discrete issue based movement stuff, and then people reacting to Trump and wanting to get involved in their local elections, but they weren't proactively getting involved for. Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden. It was just like they were organizing on their own as a reaction to Trump. And so Biden comes into office. March for Our Lives stuff was then too, right? Wasn't that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was like 2017, 2018. And Biden just didn't have that attachment. Remember in the primaries, he was certainly not the top choice of, of young people in any way. But they came around to win the election. And that's the point is like Democrats are the, like Gen Z and, and younger millennials, like they aren't going to flip to Republicans. They're not up for grabs, necessarily persuadable group. Um, it's more that they need to be pulled along and told like, Hey, I, like this is a little bit of a devil's bargain. I know you don't love us, but like we align more with your values and here's why you should vote for us. So it is really interesting. Like that his numbers among young people have dropped farther than even the olds on Facebook. Like it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. I've I've appreciated it. it's one of the things I'm I'm happy that I'm on uh, Snapchat with you uh, and you know I'm only like 1.9 million subscribers but behind you not that I'm counting uh, on our show uh, Peter shows Good Luck America I don't remember if I plugged that for folks who want to check him out it's a daily news show but I, one of the things I like about it is that it does sort of plug you into a demo that like you might not be familiar with right like most of my friends who have kids are kids right like they don't have teenagers you know so if you're a 30 something. Like you don't have a lot of opportunity to like engage with teenagers, really. So you know, I think that sometimes there's you know, it's hard to understand the perspective that's coming from this sort of rising generation that will be voting for the first or second time um, in 2024. And and I you know you I just do hear this a lot from from the people that reply, uh, you know, f- to the show, you know, is uh, like the small and vocal minority of MAGA kids you know, make up the Republicans. They don't feel like they fit in there. And then, you know, the very kind of over the top, you know, censorious, you know, kind of finger waggy left that like does not allow, you know, for freedom of thought, um, you know, it's mm-hmm. also very prominent on campus, you know, and then you have another batch of people who are just like, you know, super K hive. Right. And, but like all of those together, like only make up, uh, you know, don't even make up half the campus. Right. And there's like a whole nother half of kids that are, that are just totally, you know, sort of um, flying out in the breeze, you know, trying to figure out where they fit. That's kind of the group I'm trying to talk to with, with not my party. Uh, but I, you know, I think that that's like a huge challenge for like the Democrats is like, how do you, how do you get those folks excited you know, when you have Joe Biden and a 50-50 Senate. Yeah, I mean, Tim, your show is called Not My Party. Um, and the POV with your show is like you don't feel at home with the AOCs and you don't feel at home, obviously, with your former party. Um, but I think there's a, a real lane there. I think there's – I've talked to some younger Republican elected officials and some activists. And it's just – Gen Z is actually – Sometimes I don't know if this is true or not, but I have this McKinsey study, for example, I was reading today, um, and another expert I talked to, they said that Gen Z was actually more moderate, um, more searching, I guess is a term that someone used, uh, about politics and that millennials were the ones who are more like strident and unwilling to hear opinions they disagree with, um, and that Gen Z is actually more open it's not surprising to me that there is inevitably going to be a backlash to that i don't i don't i don't know if that's true yet that that's yeah. happening but that's interesting yeah. that they're saying that I, I do want i don't want to spend the whole time on the kids but i don't want to ask one more sure, thing sure, just sure. about the maga kids my answer to this is i i don't i actually just think that the maga kids have replaced the college republican kids you know the types that used to you know your alex p keaton's the kid that brought the briefcase to class and is wearing the khakis and, um, you know, reading God and man at Yale and whatever, like that kid is not just starting to feel a little more alienated and that the, the people that are animated about politics on campus who on the right 
are, you know, the sort of trolley Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk crowd, and they've just kind of displaced the more nerdy types. I, you know, you spent some time at TPUSA. What? How do you? What? What do you? That this is this is a concerning theory that I have. So I'd love to be disabused of that notion. But but I'm no. I'm, I think I think you're right, and uh, I think that Alex P. Keaton's still do exist in some places. It's just more fun, like not our kind of fun, but it's fun to be. Right. At a turning it's fun point to be a dick, plan. you know, Tim. It's just fun yeah. to just like <laughs> call people racial slurs, and you know, it's just all. It's yeah, just it's such it's a, a good time. The young left has a lot of intellectual muscle, but you know, it, it's all culture. It's fun to to troll and be among people who are all laughing and owning the libs, etc. Way more fun than than being like a Paul Ryan stan. Um, right. And yeah, I think that I think that's true. I just think they are very noisy. They are social media natives too, and so it's very easy to um, grab something they see from the left or from the media and make it go viral. And it's just fun to be a part of that on the internet. Uh, makes you feel like you're part of a community if you don't agree with the AOCs and you don't like people pointing fingers and canceling you if that's if that's your thing. Um, yeah, I I really think that's the case. I haven't been. I will say during co- I used to go to college campuses all the time, even before COVID or sorry, before COVID, I, I would go to campuses all the time. And it, there were people who weren't just like, uh, what's his, what's, what's his name? Milo. And, and, and yeah, sure. it wasn't that, it wasn't just that, you know, I remember visiting SMU and going to South Carolina, University of South Carolina in like 2017, 2018 and talking to young Republicans and trying to get a sense of just like where their head was at with Trump and, Etc. And there were just there were still some normies out there, the, your types from back in the day, but they were just more accommodating of Trump people too. Like they didn't outright reject them. It was just they were they were part of the team also in the college Republican campus. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know what's the what were the other youth groups like Young Americans for Liberty? And, yeah, what? Yeah, they've all got crazy. I and mean, this is the thing, like the, it's the the story. Freedom, this yeah, sort yeah. of yeah entropy story is like true everywhere. Like in the same way that Liberty University has gone from like bad to just like totally corrupt and insane and trolly, right? And the same, you know, we've documented the Claremont Institute. L- listeners might not, not have liked the original versions of all these things very much either, but like that doesn't change the fact that the degradation is there. And like this is true of YAF, like which used to be, you know, kind of a, you know, the, the place for policy discussions on campus from the right, you know, more of a libertarian right, mm-hmm. uh, you know, now has been like completely taken over by like Dinesh D'Souza charlatans and like, you know, um, um, you know, all the same stuff you see at TPUSA. It's true everywhere. Um, yeah, I, I, but so the only counterpoint to all of this is, and I probably went to nine or 10 CPACs in a row, and, and you certainly went to a bunch. Yeah. Like, I've always said that the Trump presidency was just CPAC come to life. It was the sort of the the grifter, like, sideshow acts, you know, at the circus who could never get a real job on a campaign and would just go up and do culture war bits, you know, in front of an audience of, a lot of college Republicans who were just on spring break and in Washington. And, you know, again, CPAC back in the Reagan era was, you know, at least seemingly principled. And and it sort of became, even before Trump came along, this sort of fun carnival. And I, I do feel like that sort of college Republican is like that has turned into the turning point USA type. It's just it's just kind of ramped up. It's on steroids, it's, you know, like remember with Sarah Palin drinking the big gulp and and like yeah. Donald Trump spoke at CPAC like three or four or five times before he was even taken remotely he, seriously. Yeah he'd, yeah. he'd have half empty rooms. Okay. So I want to, I want to get yeah. into this with you. Um, uh, we're going to get to news of the day stuff at, at the end. Uh, you know, so folks can stick around for, you know, BBB and Omicron, uh, discussions, but I, I do, you know, for, for listeners who don't know, you know, your background, you, know, you covered both parties, but you were really pretty deep in covering Republicans for CNN, uh, you were based in South Carolina, so obviously that was a Republican state. So most of your you know, sources from there uh, were Republicans. You just said you went to 10 straight CPACs. Uh, that's pretty big street cred as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you come at this a little bit different than, than a lot of us at the Bulwark, right? You were an observer, right? Like you were not of it in the same way that we were. So broad thoughts on just sort of the arc and, and you know, whether you know, the Bulwark view that things have gotten way worse is correct or whether we just, you know, were compartmentalizing out the bad back then. Uh, but I, I, I want to talk about this through one example, which is a guy that used to hang out a lot, with, uh, maybe not a lot, but hung out with a little bit at CPAC, Steve Bannon. 
So Bannon today is on his you know top ranked podcast in the country, and he's getting praised by Peter Navarro, the guest, for being like the quarterback behind the insurrection, for being a person that was actively organizing all the Stop the Steal efforts. His podcast was the official Stop the Steal tour. Um, I, you know, Bannon was always crazy, right? But I, I kind of, you know, had the sense back then in, in 2013 that there was a little bit of tongue in cheek, a little bit he was in on the joke, um, you know, some grievance, I, I, you know, and here he is, he's, a, he's wild eyed, unapologetic, like having the pillow man on his show talking about fucking dead Hugo Chavez stealing elections. And, and it was like the key man. And trying to overthrow the democracy. Like, did you ever get a feel for that? That that could have been where his trajectory ended? Like, what, what's your, did, did he just start taking the trolling really seriously? Like, give me some, yeah, you know, ban I will, say, I will say this to three reporters, myself, Scott Conroy, our friend, our good friend, and who was also a reporter with me, um, covering Sarah Palin back in the day and Josh Green. And mm-hmm. I think the first person, because Josh Scott Green wrote the great Bannon book. If you, great if, you, if you really want to punish yourself this Christmas and suffer yeah. through like 300 pages about Steve Bannon, Josh Green's book is excellent. It's really good. Um, and I love Josh as a reporter. Um, just for the audience listening, Sarah Palin ran for vice president in 2008. We know that. People forget now that she was really in the conversation, seriously or not, to run for president again in 2012. And she basically stoked those flames between 2009 and 2011 in a very big way. And Bannon inserted himself into her orbit somehow. He made a film, documentary film about Sarah Palin. I forget what it was called, but Scott sort of sniffed this out. Bannon reached out to him, and then we got to know Bannon pretty well. And if you go back and listen to Sarah Palin's speeches in 2011, when she was flirting with jumping in the race in Iowa, she talked a lot about the themes that you later heard coming out of Trump's mouth. Um, You know, that there's kind of like, hard boiled populism, not quite just like conspiracy racist stuff that you hear out of Bannon's mouth now, but he anti elite, anti the big that's banker. the thing. It was yeah, the yeah. anti elite anti social um, justice. An- Back then it was occupied Wall Street, you know. Totally, totally. Yeah. He was like, we need to reimagine um the Republican Party in such a way that the working class will stand up to and he he has been anti Mitch McConnell forever in the, in this way. Like he, he was talking about that. Um, and then Bannon also, I don't know if he was in on the joke. What I will say, it was like he he's a chameleon. I mean, he was a Goldman Sachs banker for a while. He's from my hometown of Richmond, Virginia. So I sort of connected with him as a source on that. He lived in Hollywood. My uncle was a record producer in, in LA for like 20 years in the 70s and 80s. And he told me one time that like, he had a meeting with Steve Bannon and some band he was representing back then. And then famously like somehow got partial rights to Seinfeld. And because he has inhabited so many worlds and and your listeners might not like hearing this, but like personally, he's kind of like fun and charming to hang out with. He's just this like big personality who like likes to, you know, drink and talk shit. And, uh, this is really important. I don't want to like leave yeah. you hanging on the vine there because yeah. I got to know Ben a little bit okay. this time too. He's charming. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah, charming, yeah, yeah. right? Like it doesn't work. Like this doesn't, you don't become a successful demagogue by being a scold that's not fun to hang out with, right? Mm-hmm. Like Stephen Miller on his own was never going to do it. Like, you know, Gollum and he like, he's sweating and like, you just look yeah. at him and you're like, I can't even imagine having a dinner with this person. You yeah. can, if you were able to just separate out your loathing of Bannon, like you could have like a rollicking dinner with him. He'd gossip with you. I mean, he loves to fucking gossip with people, right? Like that's how like Michael well, Wolf the, got all the stuff for his book. Exactly. And that's the thing is he doesn't always respond, but he's a source for a lot of reporters too. Like he understands as much as he rages against the lamestream media and the libtard media cucks, like he engages <laughs> them, you know, he responds to reporters from the New York Times and Vanity Fair and whatever. Like he gives background quotes and like he was certainly a source for a lot of people in the early Trump administration and beyond. And that's the other thing. I don't know. Like for this goes back to the CPAC thing a little bit and and maybe why Bannon is just so defiant about um, defying uh, Congress on the January 6th committee is like for people that get into it and like a lot of people got into Trump world, like 
the ride can be like exhilarating and fun. And like, it becomes like a game and you kind of think you're immune to like real world consequences because you're so enamored with the fame and popularity and power. And look, I will say like, especially like after Brexit, like I'm sure Bannon thought like, oh my God, like I can change the world. Here we see these governments toppling and like populist radicals coming into power and Bannon could plausibly like claim the mantle of, of their like Rasputin. (laughs) And he was like the ultimate dog that caught the car, you know, I mean, like he was, he got so high on his own spot. I just remember those, remember those pictures of him from like the very beginning of the Trump administration where he's like in a suit and like, you know, you know, he usually just wears his dirty three flannel shirts, like all (laughs) over each other. But he's like in this suit and his skin is like rotting. And like, uh, you know, he looks like he has cirrhosis and it's like, and he, and he's in the oval office and it's just like, how is this, how, uh, you know, and even he had to be like, I can't even believe this. Like I'm wearing a tie. I'm in the oval office. Like I'm the most powerful person. I, you know, he blew, he goes on to blow himself up, but yeah. And, and if you're someone like that, on the inside or like you have accumulated some kind of power in politics, you, it, it, you can see how he was able to bring people from the outside and the fringes in because those are the people he was going to charm. Like he was never going to win over yeah. Josh Holmes in like Mitch McConnell's office. You know, those people like hated him and thought he was a maniac. Um, so you could see how he could become like a Pied Piper. Like I remember going to, Scott came with me actually, uh, and this would have been around CPAC, maybe 2010, 11, 12, one of those years. And the Breitbart has, I don't know if they still have it, but they had that mansion on Capitol yeah, Hill, the, embassy, yeah. the, the Breitbart embassy. Yeah. And it was this big townhouse and he had a Christmas party and like, who's the, like Louis Gohmert was there and like every sort of like has been Deplorable. wannabe goofball, like everyone that like eventually came to power was at that party and Bannon was just walking through the party i remember there was a band there was a bar there were lots of just like young like women just like circling around bannon and everyone else like he was the ringleader of of this carnival and again it's just like it seemed like fun for these people like they found their crowd they were welcomed and then bannon would just pontificate about how they were going to take over the world and again like being there as a reporter who was sort of steeped in the official side of republican politics it's like, ha, ha. like this is just like, you know, this like, is just going to go clowns. on and on forever and ever and ever. And like, I don't they're know, never put a point on why you're laughing. Like, these are clowns. You're laughing because you're going around. You're like, these people are fucking delusional clowns, right? Like, like there's no way that like you know these people can barely run a blog. Like, their their racist blog is not even doing that well. Yeah, like, no, like, that's right. A, and like, yeah. not, you know, it's so like the, it, it seemed delusional at the time, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, it seems to me like that's the big lesson from all of this is like. Some of the there are very bad people involved in all this. People who have bad ethics and you know from the start, bad intentions and it's evil all the way down. But a lot of the rest of it was people that were along for the joke, that enjoyed the troll. They had this mm-hmm. little community of hobbits and deplorables, and then like all of a sudden, you get in there. And you're like, oh shit, you know, and then you, you, you know, nobody believed us. Now we did it. And so they're all, you know, this whole thing that we're still dealing with right now, the prospect of, you know, somebody that tried to steal the election running again and winning is because all of these people feel high on their own supply of having been told that they couldn't do it, having been laughed at and like, you know, now, ha ha, who's, who's laughing now? It's like, yeah, and a lot of ways, the game show hosts are going to take over the country. Yeah. And that's why in a lot of ways, I remember we were texting when this was all going on, but in a lot of ways, January 6th, like the insurrection was the natural conclusion of that concept where these sort of like this combination of like yokels, but also like doctors and boat owners or whoever like right. <laughs> love MAGA, they storm the Capitol and they get in and they're like, now what do what? we do now? Like, and like, to me, like my, my take at the time was like, this is like the dumbest, this is the insurrection of the dumb. It's like you, the dog that caught the car is the word that you use. Like, okay, we're in here now. What are we going to do? Take some selfies. Like, I don't know. Like, let's just hang out. <laughs> like it wasn't as simple and, and innocent as that, but that just reminded me of what the Trump presidency was. There are people who went along for the ride and thought they were going to lose. As we all know, Kellyanne Conway was calling people on background before election night, like trying to fix her reputation. And then they won. And even Trump too. It was like, oh shit. And then you get this combination of malevolent actors and doofuses in the White House. And then presumably a few people who were like trying to 
save the country from Trump. And it, you know, then they, that's what happened. And so I agree with you on just this notion of they get into the cow, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Okay. So my question is, and then uh, we're, we're going to leave this and go to something else, but like people who are listening to this podcast, writing for the bulwark are like, okay, these guys were idiots. It was obviously they're idiots, but they were trying like they just weren't very good at, at what they're at, at the at cooing. Like they just weren't very skilled cooers. It was an as you know uh, an idiot's coup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, but okay. So now we're we're here today, and clearly they are still rolling with it. Ten months later, if anything, they're more powerful now than they were then because they've gotten all all, all the people who are. And this will get us into our next topic about Fo- about our friends at Fox. Mm-hmm. All the people who were horrified that day, the Laura Ingrams of the world, the Mitch McConnells, the Lindsey Graham's are now on board basically at some level either tacitly or actively yeah, in in continuing to push you know the lie that undergirded this and push out people who want to go back against this help me get out of my never trump bubble like why is that not resonating with regular people because like, as best as i can tell besides the people that listen to the bulwark podcast and, and like a handful of other folks who've been you know blue pilled or whatever by this like everybody else just kind of like eh I mean, right? I, I, do you do you get a sense that there is this urgency, and and is it because of what you said? Like, do you think that other people's lack of urgency or care about the threat here is because it seems so stupid, or do you have other theories? Get get me out of my you know TDS yeah. never Trump bubble. This is no, this is hard. I mean, you inhabit this space, but writ large, there's not a persuadable slash curious middle in politics anymore, and the partisans on both sides have decided how they view January 6th. And there's also just sort of the, I, I, this is, this is me theorizing. So I'm not, I'm sure there's some poll numbers that might contradict me here, but the median voter is a, is a low information voter. And that doesn't mean they're dumb. It just means they aren't paying attention to politics every single day. Like you and I are. And part of this is stuff I've sniffed out in, in writing this piece about Gen Z. Like a lot of people really just, wanted to turn off and put Trump behind them for mental health reasons. Like there was a story in the Wall Street Journal that just popped as we're taping this about how the Washington Post traffic has plummeted after Trump. Yeah. Like people are tuning out hardcore political news. Um, and, and so, you know, you can turn on Joy Reid every night and listen to her yell about why we why we aren't doing more about January 6th. But I just think after Trump, it's a reversion to the mean. And the mean in politics before Trump was most people aren't following it. Most people kind of don't care unless there's an election coming up in the next couple of weeks. And that's why it's sort of like getting lost in the mist. And the other thing, too, is unless there's pictures, it's hard for the news to have a the, new angle on something. You mean the and, smoke and, it, and the Confederate flags and the trunk flags over the Capitol wasn't enough for people. They're just like, yeah, cool. Let's just no, no, that's what I'm saying. Like both of us use those pictures all the time in our show. I'm just saying that like covering like this, what's happening we'll get, now. What's happening now? Yeah. And, like, hearing. Right. Like a hearing <laughs> about something that happened yeah, yeah. back then when he's not president anymore is just like not going to generate the same kind of attention that something new would. And, and look, this is why, like, and I, I know you want to talk about Fox, but like Liz Cheney reading these texts from Fox news anchors, like that did give a new twist to the story. I think it was really damning for Fox, but like, it's just also like, is it persuading anybody that, <laughs> that Fox is bad? I, uh, I have a lot of rage. Persuaded? I have a yeah. lot of rage in this mouse. I sold. I'd like to pass along to like the media in Ohio voter who maybe could like, who maybe could just take a little bit of my rage off my back and like, aim it towards <laughs> supporting Tim Ryan for Senate. Uh, so we don't have a pro insurrection <laughs> Senator, uh, but that's either here or there. I want to talk about, we had a, we had a little disagreement on text, you know, I uh, just don't give people a peek behind the curtain here. We had a little disagreement on text. And so I, we're going to take it live into the pod uh, that is related to these January 6th texts. Um, uh, last week's not my party. I compared the actions of Chris Cuomo, you know, giving advice to his brother amidst the sexual harassment scandal. And, and how there was accountability for Cuomo um, to the Fox hosts who campaigned for Trump openly, call him, give him advice. Apparently, we're texting him, telling him to stop the insurrection that then later that night they went on to blame on Antifa when the Rubes were watching. And, you know, I, I feel like this is a there's a disbalance here. There's an imbalance here where where CNN dude acts badly. He gets fired. 
Fox dudes acts badly. Everybody's just like, well, that's just boys being boys. You know, uh, what else are you going to expect? And you, you felt like maybe that was not, anyway, I'll let you speak for yourself. Do you, you disagree with that take? Um, no, I think, I mean, I agree with it. I just think that, and for the audience, I used to work at CNN and, you know, I work at Snapchat and I do podcasts and I like new media, but I, you know, I went to journalism school. I have a master's in journalism. Like you can't see behind me, but like, and I don't do this on like a person on cable trying to show off their bookshelf, but like I care deeply about journalism and I read a lot of fucking books about it. And it's just like really important to me. Rank and your journalism books really quick. Top of journalism books, one to five. No, I'm just kidding. But. <laughs> not going to do that. Um, the thing with CNN is I'm, I'm passionate about CNN and proud of the work I put in there. And, and as much as CNN is an entertainment network, they are also, they care about journalism. And so, yes, they believe in accountability, but my thing with CNN is that I left in 2015, right before Trump came down the elevator. And, you know, I have lots of friends there and there's so many good reporters there, but I've just became very disillusioned with their complete, especially in prime time. It just seemed like a, an abandonment of objectivity. And like, I know maybe 85% of the time Trump does something maniacal and, and the listeners of this podcast probably agree with that, but everything was hair on fire, permanent outrage. And I think CNN slipped from being a quote unquote objective news organization into just kind of like liberal talk radio in prime time. And like that disappoints me. So there's that, but like with the Cuomo thing, yes, he should have been fired. I just wanted your show on Snapchat, which focused on both of these things just to not like necessarily just point over Fox and be like, but Fox is worse because the slippery well, slope, the, the slippery slope of establishment journalism into takes and honestly sort of like pro Democrat partisanship in a lot of ways has been frustrating for me to watch. I'm not saying that's happening at the print organizations. It is at some, especially subscriber focused ones, but it's just like the Cuomo thing was a big damn deal for CNN. And, and it goes back before the, the sexual harassment stuff. And we both talked about this at the time in our Snapchat shows, but when Chris put Andrew Cuomo on the show, they did it about half a dozen times. It was, one, a betrayal of CNN's own standards. Chris Cuomo had been previously forbidden from covering his, his brother and interviewing him on the show on CNN. And that was a that was a standard and and standards matter for journalism. And they betrayed that. But it was also just a rank display of political bias at a time when they were already under assault for being biased. And I just think that the credibility and seriousness of CNN, withered greatly and like that's a story in itself that i care about and i want to push back on you on this okay. Okay. i want to push okay. back let's okay. put over in the box the journalistic standards on cuomo's you know doing the nasal swabs on tv <laughs> buddy comedy hour like that shit was horrible it was obviously bad at the time for anybody that hadn't gone full cuomo sexual so put that in the box we agree that's bad that's about journalistic standards i want to get your criticism about bias because this is i think at the crux of our disagreement and, and it's probably because it's our respective former employers. <laughs> so you know, yeah. we have particular hatred for our own, not hatred, but, you know, particular demand for accountability for people that we had worked for. My view of CNN, I agree with you that that CNN lost its sort of patina of news, you know, credibility of being a serious news outlet and turned into more opinion. And that's and that's bad, uh, you know, and, and that they half the country tuned them out. My question is, is that really their fault? Like they tried. They had Rick Santorum on. They, who was that guy? The Trump guy that they had on? Who like? Oh, Jeffrey Lord. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lord. Lord. They had Jeffrey Lord on. Like, no, they no, had, they don't have Jeffrey you, Lord on. Only Jeffrey Lord was CNN paid for him to have right. a black car service from Pennsylvania to the studio in Washington every day for like two years. That's Think a about lot of the money. Of money. Think about the amount of money you could do journalism with. <laughs> Um, you, could, you could certainly could have like a Tanzania bureau my, or something um, no, uh, with that. No, no, okay, no, so Tim, here's Tim, the problem: Tim, Tim, you can't put any of these on. They're all fucking liars. Tim, They're all Tim, liars my, and creeps that you can't be balanced. Like, how do you be balanced during the Trump years? Like, what were they supposed to do? What were they supposed to my do? My point. My point. This is getting lost in, in in the argument. I think my point isn't just that they should have done more both sidesing. I firmly disagree with that. Okay. I just like my first week at CNN, we covered Katrina and like won awards for it. And I was really impressed by it and proud of it. And it really showcased the muscle of CNN. They had cameras everywhere. They had journalists everywhere. They covered stories from all angles. And like the problem was there was too much just Trump 
porn on TV. Like it was just panels and I wasn't seeing like the first when when the Afghanistan thing happened in August, it was like one of the first times I saw like actual reporters in Afghanistan for years on CNN. And it's just like that. My point was like there should be more like full spectrum journalism and not just punditry and takes. And I agree with you. Like there's a really it's a really difficult line to straddle between what's real and what's not in, in covering Trump. What's a lie? Is this biased? Is this like Jim Acosta peacocking like for the cameras? You know, like it's like a really difficult challenge that cable news had. Have you thought about this? Like how would you, if you were still at CNN and had they not sent you to South Carolina, they sent you to Ohio and you have to cover the Josh Mandel, J.D. Vance primary, which mm-hmm. is just entirely based on performative anti-vax, sure. like government sure. false. Just, like, how do you cover that? How do you be you fair? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think there are reporters who do this in the right way, which is like you just you you cover it as a matter of fact. This claim about the election is not true, et cetera. It's just here's a good example. I wouldn't want to imbue the coverage with just like relentless snark. One of my biggest takeaways from the Trump years in CNN was that segment that Don Lemon did with. Rick Wilson and yeah. the New York Times guy, Wajahat Ali, I think. And they were just laughing, 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 laughing at like Trump supporters being morons and mouth breathers and idiots and whatever. And like, you may believe that, but like that news object, that piece of content is viewed as quote unquote news to a lot of people who aren't watching CNN every day, who might see the clip on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and just be like, this is really what, how they talk about the country. You don't have to be a Republican to be offended by that. Like, I just think it was stupid. And like, that's the thing. Like, you can cover facts and sort fact from fiction without imbuing everything with this sarcasm and snark. And I, th- I, I just think that like, that's sort of what CNN primetime became. Now, turning it back to Fox, here's another difference. A lot of people think that Hannity and Laura Ingram and Brian Kilmeade or whatever are like seasoned, serious journalists. <laughs> But they're pundits and they're opinion people and they're talk radio people. Like Chris Cuomo is not that and was never presented as that. As much as he claimed to like say like, well, I'm allowed to have a voice or whatever. It's like you were presented. This is the apples and oranges network or the apples and bananas, right? Like this is an apple. No, it's a banana. Like this is facts. Like that's what CNN is. And so he's a performer, but he's not a opinion pundit guy in the way that Hannity and them are. And so like that, that to me is another distinction that – Sean Hannity has been showing up at Republican rallies. I mean, I just talked about Sarah Palin. He was at Palin rallies in Florida when I was there in 2008. Like yeah. everyone knows he's a partisan and CNN still has this patina of yeah, but, objectivity. But then if you're a Democrat, you're like, wait, why don't I get to have that? Like, why don't I get to have state TV? You know, I, this is this is where it becomes a challenge. I'm not saying the Democrats should have state TV, but it's like, well, they you know, do. What, what's the solution? It's your network, MSNBC. That is de- that is MSNBC, right? I mean that, that I don't I don't, think, I don't think, you think that the, it's the same as Fox? You think that what they're doing no, is the same I don't, as Fox? I don't. I was saying I, I and you and you and Crystal and like yeah. you know, there's obviously like lots of friends who are reporters there uh, who are do. And Biden's do getting work. killed. Prime, it is hard to puncture the idea at MSNBC that all Democrats are are good and all Republicans. I mean, Biden's getting killed right now. Let's let's go to Biden. For people who don't like Biden criticism um, and are going to get triggered by that um, trigger (laughs) warning, you can fast forward here until we have a fun close. Um, But um, I want to get news of the day. And anyway, I will say in in defense of the honor of the people at MSNBC, uh, I think that Biden took a lot of heat over Afghanistan, rightly. I think he's taking a lot of heat right now over his numbers. Obviously, he gets, you know, favorable coverage there. Uh, And I will just say, since I'm an opinion man, Peter, I'm a content man for good You're reasons because he since he saved us from the person that was trying to end democracy. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, he's struggling. The guy that saved us from, you know, the end of democracy. And wh- I, I wrote today about Manchin and I, and I don't I don't know that we need to, you know, go. Everybody at this point knows my views on on Manchin and how his, you know, wins above replacement, his war. Is, is higher than anybody <laughs> wow, in the Democratic Party. Is that a baseball set? Yeah. yeah, baseball reference. His war is higher <laughs> than anyone else in the party. So you might not like him, but like your other option of Cletus von Ivermectin, it's not going to be <laughs> what you want. Uh, and so the bigger issue I tried to make in this article, in addition to, you know, saying get off Manchin's back, is that like the Democrats need to turn this this narrative of the child tax credit is expiring um there are all these popular supposedly popular issue items that they have in their agenda that people including these 18 to 29 year olds are talking about want instead of being like mansion and cinema is the reason we're not getting them like republicans are the reason you're not getting them republicans yeah. are voting in lockstep 
against you, and they're they're getting no pressure right now. And so, as you talk to smart Democrats, like what is their answer to this? If you are if you are you know a Republican, you know if you're Doctor Oz and you're the Republican guy for Senate in Pennsylvania, you feel no pressure to have to say that you're going to be for something in the Democratic agenda right now. You know if you're you know, mm-hmm. the New Hampshire or Ohio Senate candidate, right? Like none, none, or none of the people that are in the Senate right now, you know, who have elections coming up, you know, Marco, who's got an election in Florida, he doesn't feel any pressure to support this agenda at all. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, that says that like the Democrats are doing a bad job selling their agenda and they need to refocus on how is there any, is there anything they can do from a strategic standpoint to, to turn this around? Like what, what do the, you know, Democratic consultant types you talk to think about that? The, well, the first thing I will say is, and this is maybe I'm slow on the uptake, but this is really the first time I've thought this, like having gone through the the Tea Party wars and the purity tests in the Republican Party and all the way up to Trump, like Trump took over the Republican Party eventually. But there were these purity tests that happened in the GOP for so long. And, and now they're happening in the Democratic Party. Like I used to like the whole Democrats and disarray thing used to be kind of silly, but there really is, a, and part of this goes back to what I was saying about Gen Z, like there really is a, a, a distinction between the activist base, the online people and progressives and quote unquote mainstream veteran establishment Democrats. Like they're following Kirsten Sinema into the bathroom with <laughs> a cell phone camera. Like that stuff is happening on the left now. So thank you for putting that into my brain. I think that's absolutely happening. And, you know, after Virginia... I had a conversation with one Democrat in Richmond who said, you know, moving forward, like the Republicans are going to be running on these culture war social issues and Democrats have to run on this sort of get back to basics on the kitchen table. Here's what I'm doing for you, you know, talking about what's in their agenda. I, I agree with you. I don't think Biden has done a very good job explaining it. I think the media um, is obsessed with process in Washington. And someone made the good point on Twitter that rarely do bills get covered in terms of policy and what's in them until after they pass. Up until then, it's the price tag, it's the cinema mansion dance, it's like whatever Capitol Hill thing Manu Raju got today for CNN. Like it's not what's in the bill. But my my pushback on this Democratic consultant was, is that even true? Like, I really think that the contest between culture and like pocketbook stuff, that's a real question. I mean, I would like to think that if gas prices go down and the child tax credit thing works and Medicaid gets suspended in certain states, that that will help Democrats. But the culture stuff is so powerful. And like Democrats also like run on culture in certain ways, too. And this is I'm not saying they're running on it. Like, this is where I disagreed with this recent Jamel Bowie column where he said, actually, Democrats in office aren't running on defund the police and they're not running on, you know, language things like Latinx. Again, our median voter is, isn't just hearing what's in Build Back Better. They're hearing the like dumb shit that like pops up on Twitter and social media and cable news. And that's megawatt, oh. hot button, like cultural topics. And I, I, I'm not saying that like this is going to win. I just saying like that, that feels like the contest, like on the right, Republicans really don't have any sort of big, bold policy ideas other than like they've literally you know, done. tax cuts and and maybe some stuff around and cer- certainly around abortion, um, the border. but the border and yeah, like, but the, you know, honestly, like voters are with Republicans on the border, not Democrats. Yeah. It's like Biden's worst number. So I, I want to posit something. Okay. Uh, the Democrats, here's a culture war idea. So if the Democrats can't convince voters, which I, I don't know that this is true, that they can't convince voters that, you know, the provisions of the Build Back Better thing are something they want, but they sure haven't really, they sure haven't tried. And as of as what we can see on the field right now, none of the none of the campaigns or politicians are acting like these are potent issues for the on the, that benefit the Democrats right now. As we, we had the spike in, in the Omicron today in New York, you know, in particular, there's a lot of sense of, of how, how much is expanding. And, and I, I feel like the Democrats are really stuck in a hard spot on this, right? Because there's so much COVID fatigue, yet they have to be the responsible ones, you know, because Republicans are just like at this point, let's, you know, you know, kind of, uh, everybody can just drink the Kool-Aid and, you know, whoever gets the bad batch can die. And, you know, that's just life these days um, for the pro-life party. But the mandates aren't popular. Masking the rules, the sanctimony isn't popular. People are tired of it. And we have this other wave 
you know, I think I saw even Chris Hayes on Twitter said, even I'm tired of it, right? Like, you know, who's been like the most advocate for, right, for doing rules, right? I'm tired. I, I, I'm tired of it. I'm like, oh, we, we had a, we, were, we were supposed to go to New York. I was supposed to see you there. And like, we're going to a concert and I have to be like, oh, I'm going to see a grandma after that. What should I do to be responsible? Everybody's tired of all that. Is the winning culture award issue for the Democrats? Like the fact that it's trying to turn this and blame it on the Republicans, the fact that this pandemic is still going on and, and be like, uh, you know, there's a Quinnipiac poll that said 97 percent of Democrats had their had two shots, at least and like 54 percent of Republicans are going from memory. It might that, those might be off a little bit, but that it was it was a gap that wide. Mm -hmm. Like, shouldn't the Democrats try to fight on some culture war ground that's popular? Um, I, you know, obviously defund the police, wasn't it? But, it, uh, you know, is there a way they can turn the tables or is that? Yeah, a dude, pipe dream? I think. I think you're I think you're really smart to say that. And I tweeted and, uh, you know, you can't take credit for takes if you just tweet them and no one sees them. But like back back in the summer, I tweeted all this talk like Biden's approval ratings are going down. The most overrated conversation topics in Washington were build back better process and Afghanistan. And the most underrated were covid and gas prices. And, and that was you know, then Biden's numbers went even lower and gas prices popped up, et cetera. There's a strong correlation there. But the reason is there's correlation is most people, again, don't follow the ins and outs of politics. But two things that touch everyone's lives every single day at this point are COVID and gas prices. And like, that's the reason they're so impactful on politics. Politics is like, like made and, way more complicated by the pundits and, and Dems are losers on both right now. Just really quick. Yeah, correct. Just correct, the, correct. Yeah. No, no, so this is what I'm, this is yeah. what I'm getting at, which is culture war stuff doesn't affect everybody. Not everyone cares about abortion. Not everyone cares about Tony Moore funding the schools. schools. Not everyone cares about like the 1619 project, but everyone cares about COVID. And sure. I was sent this story the other day by so many people who aren't even on Twitter of your, Home state governor, Jared Police, is it police or polis? Polis. polis. I mispronounced that on Good Luck America. Sorry, polis flax. Um Connor Cahill, he's a great American. Yeah, and he said what some of my Democratic friends have said too, which is just like, if these like MAGA people don't want to get vaccinated, <laughs> let them get sick. Let them die. I don't care. Like that's literally what the tone of Polis's commentary was because he was being pressed by this kind of like Poindexter NPR host who was like, why won't you institute another mask mandate in the state? And Polis, to his great credit, talk like a normal fucking person. And he goes, because people are fucking sick of this. It's hard to enforce. And the real thing that's going to stop this pandemic are vaccines and boosters. And if you don't, in the same reason, if you don't wear a coat when you go out in the freezing cold and you get the flu and you get sick, that's on you. And he said, if these Republicans or MAGA people or people don't want to get vaccinated, they're the ones making the pandemic worse. They need to get vaccinated. And like maybe this Omicron thing will just like exacerbate people even more and just be like, dude, get the fucking shot. And like all of that is to say, I think that's a really smart take of yours that COVID, because it touches everybody, can be a culture war because Republicans – on popular opinion, people who are unvaccinated, rather, are on the wrong side of a public opinion. Also a wrong side of public opinion, though, I think, are people don't want mask and vaccine mandates to, like, come into restaurants and stuff. Like, that stuff isn't that popular, even though people on Twitter think it is. Yeah, that's right. And Polis, uh, you know, here's the thing about Polis, by the way. Colorado's death rate per capita rate is, like, towards the bottom. You know, and, and you you just have we have to hear about DeSantis and, and, and Newsom and like all the big hot button people who are, who are on both opposite ends of the debate. But like Polis is, you know, the, the state has, you know, kept its deaths down, you know, as compared to other states. The vaccination rate is high. Uh, you know, I, I understand there were some on the left that got mad at him because it's like, well, you know, there are people and, and this is a fair point, right? There are people that have comorbidities or other for other reasons where the vaccines aren't working and you know, compromised. Uh, and they're like, so it does actually matter, right? Can't just say let live and let live, right? Because it 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 punishes people who are doing the right thing. But this but the, the, this this notion of trying to turn the tables a little bit and put the pressure yeah. on the other side and say, I, you know, I, I, we can do what we can. We can be responsible. We can put some rules in place that are necessary. But like heavy handed finger wagging at people who are doing the right thing while ignoring the poor feelings of the people who have decided that like the vaccine might have antifreeze in it or whatever, yeah. you know, is, 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 is not helpful. Well, this is, um, this is a thing. This is a thing that like, I, the Biden white house needs better. They, they were good at the camp during the campaign of finding these outside politics validators or people who are in politics who are just 
good messengers. And those could have been influencers or athletes or micro influencers in various cities around the country who could carry the message in a way that like Biden and the white house cannot. And like, you know, there are politicians, maybe Tim Ryan's one of them. Max Rose is running again on Staten Island. He's probably one of them. Like Ruben Gallego in Arizona, like people who like talk like regular people like Spanberger is another example, even though she might not have a district. Talk anymore, to me like a human. Talk to me like a human. And that's a big thing. And, 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 you know, I know you, you think I don't listen to sort of like, right wing podcast and I'm not saying Rogan is right wing, but I I I remember this clip. No, I just don't think that you punish yourself with them as no, the you, that I yeah, no, you punish <laughs> yourself. But there was this Bill Burr who yeah, comedian. is not not a liberal, but he's a comedian. He's from New York. He's he's in the sort of he's pals with Chappelle. So he's definitely in the like anti cancel culture thing cohort. But he like he's also like can be pretty funny and he's like basically the embodiment of like a white working class Irish bro. He was on Rogan and Rogan was doing this thing where he's trying to like needle Bill Burr about like, come on, like this mass stuff is stupid. Vaccine stuff is stupid. And Bill Burr was like shot back and was like, I'm not playing this fucking game with you. Like, I think you should fucking wear a mask. I want this shit to be over. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, you're like addicted to like trolling and whatever. And like Bill Burr kind of got into him with it a little bit because Burr like wants to travel. He wants to have a life. And like, it, I just he's the kind of person that like needs to be out there more being like, get the fucking shot, you idiots. And if you don't, yeah. that's on you. Because I do think they can, Biden started out by trying to like persuade the unvaccinated and hopefully Omicron isn't as, as fatal and, and, and widespread in that way as, as the Delta variant or, or previous. And at some point it's just like, use this to bend the electorate in your direction and be like, do you want this to be over? Stick with us and fuck those people. <laughs> I don't know. I like, I kind of like it. <laughs> okay. Last thing on this. And then, um, we'll get to fun stuff. If, you know, for everybody's weekend, you know, give them a little bit of joy. Uh, if they, if they've made it this long, I, I saw one, one little point, one little data point that made me wonder if, if we are all wrapping ourselves around the axle and by we, I mean me, because I've been kind of critical of the democratic st strategy. I know you have too. Um, and, and you know, while Biden could, and while the Democrats could have done some things a little better, some things a little worse on the margins, I, I do wonder if if the Biden numbers a little bit out of his hands. And, and the the data point I saw is that Boris Johnson, the anti Biden from an ideological standpoint, from an, uh, you know treatment of COVID and you know party ID, his numbers started in July to tank. When it was clear that COVID wasn't going away, that the you know global supply chain issues were you know going to be problems. Obviously, gas prices are high everywhere, a and his numbers are now worse than Biden's. He's in the low twenties. I, I know that a lot of there's some specific scandals and controversies that are happening over there, uh, but then when you glance around to other Western leaders, every Macron's numbers are down. Everybody's numbers are down. Yeah, and, and so I do wonder is. Are we overanalyzing this? Are we, you know, inside our little pundit bubble here? And like the reality is just Occam's razor. Like if the gas prices go down, if the supply chain issues get figured out, and if people like, you know, don't have to wait five months for their couch to get ordered. And, you know, if the economy starts to level out for people who, you know, are at the lower end of the income scale or working, anybody, middle class person who goes to the grocery store doesn't want to pay $6 for, you know, like something they're paying $3 for the other week. I, I, does that solve 90% of his problems? Is that possible? Yeah. yeah. So I think you're, I, I love the, when you sent through the Boris chart the other day on our group chat, because I think it's dead on. And for the same reasons I was just saying, COVID and gas prices are real life, real world, everyday things that people are, that's how they're engaging with the world beyond their household and their friends uh, and relating to politics. It's not like the latest price tag on build back better. Um, uh, I think it was YouGov the other day had a poll and like 53% of the country either has no opinion of Kirsten Cinema or has no idea who she is. <laughs> like the Washington conversation could not be further removed from the everyday concerns of American people of all ages and it's getting worse. So that needs to be said. But yeah, I mean- I can tell you, you I, don't watch MSNBC day in, day out because it's cinema and they say it 100,000 times a day um, because right, so that, know, she's, yeah, she's, 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 uh, she's uh, enemy number one um, on, on my network. And a grand total of 100,000 people are watching that <laughs> channel uh, at any given moment. So, 
But I, I think there's a third factor, okay. which is both of those things are true, like gas prices. By the way, Biden's approval rating, I tweeted this last night, is bending slightly back upward. And I looked at the gas buddy chart of nationwide <laughs> gas prices, and it's like, it tracks, man. It's like, <laughs> it's very correlated. I'm not an economist, but like, that might, if I don't overthink politics, I think I'm a better journalist for it. And then the third angle, though, is is media noise here. And it it's because press coverage of Boris Johnson, Macron, Biden, I mean, it's certainly more endemic in, in U.S. political coverage is when the poll numbers are up, it's positive. And when the poll numbers are down, it's like, what can he do to fix it? And so, you know, the media noise about Joe Biden becomes why can't he fix this? Inflation is his fault. Supply chain is his fault. Are gas prices his fault? I don't know. Like, it's just like, that's the, and that, that stuff starts to seep out. And the American public is just, you know, if a pollster calls, they're just going to like repeat the last thing they heard or the last. Yeah, this is why I know that it's not good for our body politic. I know that it doesn't, it goes against the Bulwark's brand of comedy and of norm abiding and, you know, the, the great Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, Halcyon <laughs> days. But like, honestly, I just, I don't know if the Democrats can really do anything except for just blame the Republicans, just, just go scorched earth on like, they're extending the virus. They're nihilists. They're not passing anything. They don't actually want to help you because I, you know, all of these problems that you just laid out are intractable and Biden doesn't have a magic wand and he's got a 50, 50 Senate. So anyway, um, for another day, I want to, you are a, you're a tastemaker content man of your own um you know you have a sensibility about you you live in the home that was previously owned by a cast member of a 80s sitcom in venice beach uh, you're kind of living your david duchovny californication life so for those out out in america who maybe aren't as you know refined as you and your tastes I, I want across music television movies your top three 2021 essential pieces of content for for listeners who are you know looking to get away from annoying in-laws over the holidays and binge on something or listen to a new tune what do you got i love that first of all since katie's dad is a fan of your content and it will probably be listening to this i might have lived the david new Coveney lifestyle in <laughs> venice when i moved here i do not currently that's um, true yeah that is true uh you're, you're... chris just strike that from from the record um uh so that's a good question. I, I mean, I think going back to a lot of what we've been talking about today, both of us have been, we've talked about this too, Tim, like I have tried my best to intentionally scale back my screen time and my, you know, passing engagement with Twitter and things like that. And so escapism is something we've been doing a lot of even in 2021, not just in 2020. So I will say my number one artist that I just have data on this from, from Spotify uh, this year was- You're wrapped. I'm just saying, like, I have data. I could pretend yeah. to like give you a cooler answer, yeah, but okay. my number one artist was was Krangbin, and yeah. in part because it's a good like kind of like happy hour vibe, you know, like you just sort of like put on Krangbin radio or Krangbin playlist and just let it ride. It's sort of a you know vibey yeah, I'm like spell that on. for the audience here. K H R U A N G B I N. Is that right, Krangbin? Mm -hmm. I, in my head, I've I've also I've, I've always called them like Crew Begeden. Yeah, I like. I actually haven't said it out loud okay. until now. Um, yeah, yeah, there you go. And you know, good, good vibey music, good playlist. Um, I would say shows. I don't know if you'll like this, but um, we watch the Great British Baking Show, and I, I love that shit. I don't understand people that watch food making on television. <laughs> you can't eat the food. How do you judge? I got the only thing I like about reality shows is ranking. Like that's what I did. I did like the singing shows because like I get to rank you. You know, I'm uh, at home. Mm -hmm. I'm I have my I'm my in the in home Simon Cowell, but mm -hmm. I can't rank. I don't know. I can't. I'm not. Can't taste it. It's horrible. I can't. I can't that's watch fair. it. That's totally fair. It's it is a very precious British thing. The, the the whole show and and you know the contestants are like, this is uh, Mary trapshaw from shropshire on tyne and she's a vicar's wife and in her spare time loves to tend her garden and play with her two poodles like mansard roof and tot tot and like it's like that kind of thing it's just very sweet and that's why it's nice um a vicar's I mean, wife i'm a cynical hipster but i like a vicar's it. wife is that an a episcopal wife. clergy man i uh, think it would be episcopal yeah okay. yeah. Right. yeah yeah i guess and then um I will book? say the best. You could also book. throw a book, or if you want. I'd say the best book I read this year, and you will like this. I hope okay. 
And I want you to read it, honestly, man, because we both put in a lot of time at McDonough Gym uh, going to Kenner Summer Basketball Games in D.C. The late John Thompson's autobiography, I Came as a Shadow, I read at the beginning of 2021. And you should probably read it if you like college basketball and sports, but I loved it because he was a obviously like a trailblazer, but not in like a beloved way like a lot of people he was very polarizing but he was very committed Trailblazer to his- was a black coach for people who, who don't first know, yeah yeah you know. so the first like not not necessarily the first black coach in college basketball but the first black coach to win an ncaa championship and he just like settles a lot of scores about his you know big east times but it's also about race it's about politics it's about washington dc and like the 70s and 80s and there's also just these like insane stories in there there was a just to give you a flavor alonzo morning played for georgetown i think in like the early 90s and he was famous in dc when college basketball was at its heyday and one of the east coast's biggest drug traffickers i think his name was like rayford johnson wasn't like necessarily like dealing drugs to georgetown players but he was hanging out with them because they were cool celebrities and they were hanging out with him and John Thompson had to go meet with this drug kingpin and like the FBI like bugged his office. And there's just like so many stories about the difficulty of being a black person, not just in, in the country, but in Washington uh, at a Catholic school in DC in college basketball, he would hold grudges against like student reporters for the Hoya who wrote like bad (laughs) stories about him like 15 years ago. And he's like, I just want to say, fuck you. Like, it's Our just like coach very- at GW hated me. I was the radio <laughs> man and I was a brat and I would do the radio and the post games, Carl Hobbs. And I, I'm sure John would have hated me. I would, I would yeah. ask the, the dick question that you weren't supposed to ask. And he was like, this is supposed to be the student radio. They're supposed to be nice to me. Like, you know, yeah. they wanted Pravda, but no, yeah. some of us college collegiate sports journalists want it. You know, we weren't Chris Cuomo. You know, we had standards, okay? We had serious <laughs> questions that needed to be asked. Anyway, I came as a shadow. It came out in 2020, but I read in 2021. Like, you just, if you even passingly like sports and want just, like, a good, great piece of history, like, it is so damn good. Um, can I ask you who yours are? Well, I'm going to do my music list, which people can read at the Bulwark. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I want to add a sports book to this as well. Uh, and that is Across the River, which is about Edna Carr High School in New Orleans and uh, the football team there and the coach of that football team who is just an amazing person. And even if you don't like sports, you could read this book. Uh, actually, though, it would, it would help if you, if you like football. And the coach, uh, Bryce Brown at Edna Carr, uh, Algiers is across the river from the French Quarter. And it is just you know, like highest death per cap murder rate in the world, you know, whereas gentrification is coming to some parts of New Orleans because it's separated by the river, uh, hence the name across the river, like that gentrification is not coming to this neighborhood and his players had been killed. And, you know, just as a mentor for these kids, uh, it takes them through the year. It's kind of like a season on the brink for the, ba- you know, classic basketball book of the Indiana basketball team, but it's about this mm-hmm. high school football team. Um, and I, for, to me, I also felt that way. Like it was just, you know, there's always these talk about the challenges, you know, in, in real America, what's happening out there in real America and yeah. coal country and JD Vance and like Algiers is as real America as any of these places. And the challenges these kids are, were facing are just unimaginable. Um, I have just, a, uh, it was a very cool book. I have a, I have a thought that just popped into my head about this and it's, it's also related to media, but I grew up and I'm sure you grew up loving great sports writing and like i subscribe to like sports illustrated and read books by like norman mailer about boxing and just like i we obviously watch more sports back then but in the same way that political news has veered into just take culture you know it just it really feels like sports has gotten way and it's always been like yelling people yelling like pti style on tv but i don't see a lot of great sports writing anymore maybe this is because i'm like not seeking it out but some of the best writing comes from sports writing books, magazines, whatever. And then two, like it is for a lot of people, a way to understand poverty race. Like, you know, like sports is a, is a fascinating, useful, entertaining gateway into learning about how other parts of our country live. Like last chance you is a very good example of that on Netflix. Like I consider that journalism because it it takes you on a, on a journey. Yes. But like, you learn about somewhere you've never been and you learn about class distinctions and education. And like, that's why 
across the river is so good. I haven't started it yet. I got a copy of it, but that's why the John Thompson book is so good. Like yeah. I forget about great sports writing sometimes because we're just like awash and yelling and like Jokic's assists or whatever, or like Isaiah Thomas signing with yeah. the Lakers. And I just, I what's, miss what's, what's who's going to win the MVP. It's like, it's December, you know, like we're yelling, they're yelling. Stephen A. Smith is like, you know, yelling yeah. at the white guy, whatever his name is. Yeah. Uh, skip. Uh, my other books, <laughs> uh, I, like I said, my music article is coming, but you have to appreciate this. Sophomores is a good rec for you. It's a uh, fiction book, okay. uh, a little coming of age, slice of life novel, but the main characters are Irish uh, Jesuit school attendees. So multiple generations, really good at the beginning of the year. And, um, I, you know, I read, I needed a break. I was reading a lot of nonfiction for a yet to be disclosed project that I'm working on. And I needed a break from that. So I read a YA book. And if hmm. you have a YA in your life, a young adult, the house in the Cerulean Sea was so charming and magical. Hmm. And I can already tell that it's going to be like a Harry Potter movie. So you can get ahead of that. Those are my advice. Uh, Peter, uh, when I guessed with Perry Bacon, I gave him the opportunity to ask me an uncomfortable question. And he did. And it was some of people's favorite part of the episode for those who made it 90 minutes in. So I'll give you the same opportunity now. You do not have to take it. Uh, it can be a rant, a critique, a compliment or a query in my direction, and then we can, you know, kick people into their weekend. Uh, well, what did Perry ask you? Or am I not allowed to know? Mm, what did Perry ask me? Uh, Perry asked me about Toulouse and how that affected my thinking about race in the country. Uh, we did that interview right around the George Floyd time. I really want to have Perry back and kind of to do a retrospective a little bit outside the heat of, you know, all the BLM yeah. uprisings. But that's what He's he a me. great reporter. He's um, really good. So... I say this, this is kind of like a mental health question, but I'm asking okay, because great. I struggle with the same things, but I feel like I've made progress. I sometimes worry that you are not on online or on your phone too much because we all are in different ways, but that you are, and, and you, I appreciate that you're fighting the good fight and you're passionate about this stuff. Like I didn't come out of politics and see my world fall apart. Like I came out of media, but like, do you worry that you're a little too online at the moment? Like a lot of people are dialing back their use of social media and engaging with political yeah. news. Uh, does Tyler say that to you? Like, are you like, dude, like just kind of take a Twitter break and watch the nuggets or what? Yeah, it's interesting. Tyler's dialed back. He's dialed back a lot. Actually. He's been off Twitter a lot. I, it's hard, you know, to do what we're doing you know, here at the bulwark. Uh, you, you really have to like know what's happening. Right. And so like, how do you, yeah. How, how, how do I maintain that balance? Um, I would love for listeners to provide me ideas about this. I, I do think that like separating myself out from the little endorphin rush of Twitter and of like seeing how many clicks things got and like, you know, my retweets and, you know, all that sort of thing. Like, I think that, you know, in the endorphin rush of like the fight of the engagement, I, I could probably dial back on that for sure. But my question, but Twitter, as horrible as it is and as frustrating as it is, as, like remains the best discovery tool for me, right? And so like uh, in order for me to dial back, I feel like I need a replacement discovery tool. And and Google Reader used to serve that purpose for me. That was, I was so sad that Google Reader went away. Um, shout out to other uh, geriatric millennials who, who feel that way. Um, I used to G-chat and Google Reader was the solution that got killed. So what, you know, that is my problem is that like I do not want to you know, I, I want to come to these podcasts and to my writing and have a unique pers and have a unique perspective that's deeply knowledgeable about what's going on. And I feel like that is added to, you know, because I you know have such a diverse and wide following of people I gain information from. But then at the same time, while I'm getting that information, I like can't help myself but like, you know, shout, you know, shoot, shoot a little nag at somebody. Right. Yeah. And it's like, so how, how do I balance that? I, I, I don't I don't have a great answer to that. I, I, I yeah, really don't. I that's fine. And I think that a lot of journalists, um, I'm not going to call you journalist yet. You're still a content man, but a lot of journalists, at least in DC and politics. And I feel like as much as I am one, I'm still like recovering from the day to day beat and like doing this for 15 years. But you feel like you have to be on Twitter to know what's going on. The change I've made is like setting aside time to go actively read and seek things out and then putting it away rather than just sort of like casually flicking through it. And I, again, that's my, that worked for me. It, it might not work for you, but uh, to plug a thing that I did along almost 
eight years ago, I, I wrote a piece, a paper at Harvard, a study, but I tried to write it like entertaining book style about Twitter's influence on politics and political media. And it was called, Did Twitter Kill the Boys on the Bus? You can Google it. But Tim, you are quoted in there. And I still remember like my journalist instinct was to render a verdict either way. And that's not the right way to do it. Like things are complicated and nuanced. And you had some great quotes in there. One of them was like, if you were a political junkie in like 2000 and you were like looking for exit polls or like the latest like data on this state or entertaining story about so-and-so candidate, like where would you go? Like the magazine rack at the bookstore? Like the you'd log on to like three or four websites, like Twitter – Literally, at a freshman at GW, that's what I did. I went to I read yeah, Bill Crystal's. Hey, I went right. to the library yeah. and got the weekly standard. <laughs> yeah, right, you'd have like, to yeah. like you'd have to like wait till four p.m. every day to watch like Inside Politics on CNN. Judy Woodruff. Like, yeah, that was yeah, your, that has, was your Judy fix. Judy's awesome. Judy's yeah. awesome. But yeah, that was your fix. Like that was your fix. And Twitter has so many gross aspects to it and things that are addictive and, and damaging in that respect. But it also like it corrects bad reporting fast. Like you can shoot down bad shit out there. Um, it connects people to experts in a way that never happened. Like as a journalist, you can very quickly find experts, activists, people. St- I just literally, as we speak, and getting a text from a, a Hispanic activist in Texas for this piece I'm writing and like DM'd her on Twitter, right? And with all the bad stuff, it is great for discovery, but it is a challenge. I, I will say though, like scaling back my screen time and redirecting it maybe to like TikTok or like, New York Times crossword app has, I think, made me a little bit 10% happier. Who knows? Yeah, I'm anyway, glad, I'm glad you're great. concerned about my mental health. I think you also might be concerned about your follower count, which is deeply beneath me. <laughs> um, I, we're not going to tell people by how many, but it was close for a while. Not anymore. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think that I, I, I would love to hear listener feedback on on the best way to do this because I I, I think that it's important you know, that I uh, you know JVL tries this. This is my problem. JVL's off Twitter supposedly, though he sends me tweets from time to time, so I do wonder. And uh, you know his newsletter's so good because he's reading a ton of other stuff, right? Yes, and so I feel thing. like I'm sacrificing yeah. this, right? So he's reading a ton of others, like his discovery is just totally different. He signed up to 100 newsletters, so maybe I could do that. I could sign up to 100 newsletters, but at the same time, I do I feel like every once in a while. He'll come to me and he only has to write one news, you know, he writes one newsletter a day and, you know, is editing and he'll, you know, he's not going TV hits about the news of the day, right? Uh, he'll come to me and be like, hey, did you see this? And I'd be like, yeah, fuck you. JVL, I saw that 11 hours ago, right? Like everybody's seen this. So that's the problem. Like, how do you fix that? And I guess maybe it's, maybe it's screen time. Maybe it's limiting, you know, myself to a certain amount of time per day. I don't know. And I, and I think that it kind of ties back to the Perry's question debate because I also think maybe it will self reflect because I can already see myself playing with Toulouse. And at times, like not giving that the attention and the presence that I should, and um, and so hope maybe I can I, I can self correct through that, seeing my miserable Twitter addiction through her eyes. Uh, Peter, it is so good to hang out. Thank you for coming to the Bulwark Podcast. People should check out Puck. Uh, people should subscribe to Good Luck America on Snapchat. People should follow your scaled back Twitter feed. And uh, you know, I hope that Omicron does not ruin our plans. But uh, regardless, I will see you for a concert soon. I am excited to enjoy our fellowship together. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming to the Bulwark podcast, for staying you know, however fucking long I went. Uh, we'll be back next week with more guest hosts. Charlie's still on vacation. I'll be back here end of the month guest hosting for another show. Check me out then. We'll see y'all.